Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> and please, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. This is our scripture reading this morning. Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. And once you've found that, if you would, please turn to the Old Testament, to 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 to 14. It's our sermon passage, 1 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 14. Once you've got that, tuck your finger in there, put a, put a bookmark uh, in there, and, and then turn with me back to Matthew chapter 4, where we will read verses 1 to 11. Brothers and sisters, you are about to hear not my voice, though I am the human minister whom God has appointed to this task. You're about to hear the voice of the Lord. God is to speak to you now as his word is being read. Remember that he is present. He's here with us. But spiritually, he is among us. And so listen to the voice of the Lord. Listen to his word. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now turning to our sermon passage, 1 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 14. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Calah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and, stay, and save Calah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Calah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Calah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Calah. And fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck, struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Calah. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Calah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Calah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Calah, to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then said David, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Calah, to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Calah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Calah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Calah. And they went wherever they could, could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Calah, he gave up the expedition. And David re remained in the strongholds of the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. 
Our gracious God and Father, again, we are thankful to you for your word. We're thankful that it is the fullness of revelation of you. It tells us all that we need to know in this life, what we need to believe, how we ought to conduct ourselves in this life. And we're grateful for it. And we're thankful for these passages that we have heard this morning. We're thankful for what they teach about you, the living and true God, and how you deliver your people, how you protect your people and provide for them. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for us now through the preaching of your word. We ask for your blessings upon those of us who hear and upon the one who preaches. May we worship you as your word is preached. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now you may remember that when we considered Joshua chapter 24 a few weeks back, a couple of weeks back, we read about how God reminded the Israelites there of his delivering them from the hand of their enemies and how he gave their enemies into his hand. Chapter 24, uh, which is the, the consummation of the book of Joshua, it recounts a number of the mighty deeds of the Lord on behalf of his people in the promised land. But the work of clearing the land wasn't over. Though Joshua and the Israelites, they had been tasked with going through the land of Israel, clearing out all of the pagans who were there, it wasn't over. The pagan peoples had to be driven out of the land in order for their various idolatries to be eradicated. But David's forebears had not finished the work. And Saul now, it seems, was asleep at the wheel. Instead of continuing the work of ridding the land of pagan inhabitants, of ridding the land of the Philistines, which as king he should have been doing, Saul was chasing David all over Judah trying to kill him. And so David, even though he's fleeing from Saul, asks the Lord whether he ought to go and attack an army of Philistines attacking the town of Calah, which was about 12 miles southwest of Bethlehem. Now, as you'll remember, just prior to our passage this morning, in chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, Saul had just slaughtered all of the priests, indeed all of the inhabitants of the city of Nob. Only one inhabitant, one of the sons of the chief priests, survived. And he, Abiathar, joins David at Calah. And he brought the ephod, the oracle device, with him. This morning, as we work our way through the sermon, I would ask you to consider this. The enemy desires to lure us into his hand. But by faith in Jesus Christ, you are safely in the hands of the Lord. Again, the enemy desires to lure us into his hand. But by faith in Jesus Christ, you are safely in the hands of the Lord. The sermon has two main parts. The first... I will give. And the second, give. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. The first, I will give. And the second part of the sermon, God did not give. And so let's look at the first part of the sermon. Now I will give. Verse 1 says that they told David that the Philistines were fighting against the town of Calah and were robbing the threshing floors. Now we're not told who the they is. But most likely it refers to people who were fleeing Cala or who lived in the area around the town. Regardless of whom it was, David senses that he might be of service. And so he made uh, an inquiry of Yahweh. He asked the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? And Yahweh responded to him, told him to go and to attack the Philistines and save Cala. David doesn't want to presume uh, on a number of counts. He doesn't want to presume. He doesn't want to presume that he would automatically have victory against the Philistines. He doesn't want to presume that he is the one who's supposed to carry out these campaigns against the enemy of the king. And so he asks the Lord, and the Lord tells him to go and to do it. David, it, it appears, does want to go and to fight the Philistines. Otherwise, he likely wouldn't have asked the Lord. But David's men had other thoughts on the matter. Now, verse 13, toward the end of our sermon passage this morning, it tells us that by this time David had about 600 men with him. And so he had a fairly impressive fighting force. Not quite a battalion, but a pretty healthy number of soldiers. But in verse 3 we read, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah, 
How much more then if we go to Kela against the armies of the Philistines? David's men feel as though they would be moving out of the frying pan of Saul's hot pursuit of them and into the fire of battle with the Philistines. And though they've got a decent sized group of men, they don't think that that's enough to fight against uh, the, the men who are sieging, laying siege to Kela. And so this puts a kink in David's plans. Who would have expected his men to be afraid? And so David had to go and inquire of the Lord a second time. Verse 4 gives God's answer. Arise, go down to Calah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. Into your hand. I will give the Philistines. The Lord doesn't rebuke the men. He doesn't rebuke David as their leader for having to come back a second time and inquire of him. He simply commands David to arise and to go to Calah. And then he says that he will give the enemy into their hand. God is going to do for David the very thing that he commands David to do. It's in the form of a command what God tells David to do. Go. Attack. God is going to do it through David and his men. He's going to use them as the instrument in his mighty hand. But I think we can add that the same is true for you and for me. Now, primarily our battle in this life, by God's grace, we're not, we're not fighting physical battles against the spiritual enemies of the Lord. Primarily our battle is a spiritual battle, and it's on a personal battlefield for the most part. We're fighting temptation. We're fighting against the world and the flesh and the devil. We're struggling. We, we are the church militant in this life. And there is a great amount of spiritual warfare that's going on. But thankfully, we don't have to add to that spiritual warfare physical, a literal physical battle. God has given us everything that we need to fight the spiritual battles that he commands us to fight. God commands us to do nothing for which he hasn't already given us the means to be obedient. Now, it's true. We still will fail fully to be obedient. We'll still fail perfectly to be obedient. And yet God has given us everything that we need to be obedient. We can now do what God commands us. We don't have to. We're not compelled in the way that we once were before we knew the Lord to sin. The main battle has already been fought. Jesus already is victorious over Satan. His resurrection from the dead marked the beginning of Satan's inevitable downfall. And so the battles that we fight today are primarily skirmishes against residual sin in ourselves. Verse 5 says, And David and his men went to Calah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Calah. God fought the battle through David and his men. He gave them the victory. But notice who gets the credit for the win at the end of verse 5. David. He saved the inhabitants of Cala, we read there. Now, this is, in a sense, the opposite, but, but similar, the opposite of what we noticed in Joshua chapter 24, where God glossed over the egregious, heinous sins of his people. Here, though, God is the one to whom the battle belonged, he gives credit to David for saving the people of Cala. And he operates somewhat similarly with us. He gives us commands that we are to keep, and yet he works through us to keep those very commands. Now the Philistines we read in verse 1, they were robbing the threshing floors, meaning that they were stealing the grain that had been gathered from where it had been threshed. But David and his men not only defeated, defeated the Philistines, but they took their livestock as well. Now back in chapter 22, verse 20, we read there that one of the sons of the priest Abiathar escaped Nob and he came to David. And this is key uh, for something that uh, we'll bring out a little later on. It says there that he escaped Nob, he came to David. Now in verse 6 of our passage, we get a little more information about that meeting, including the fact that Abiathar's coming to David happened right after the battle at Calah. Verse 6 says, When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to, David to Calah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. This linen 
Uh, this wasn't the linen ephod that the priests wore, but the special ephod that carried the oracle stones, the Urim and the Thummim. And this was a significant development because at this stage in Israel's history, in the era of kings, the Urim and the Thummim were employed on behalf of the king to discern God's will. But now they're not in the presence of Saul, the one who had slaughtered the very priests who uh, were to, to make use of the Urim and the Thummim. They were in the presence of David. They had come into his camp now at Calah. And this brings us to the second point of the sermon, God did not give. The significance of this is immediately seen beginning in verse 7. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Calah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Listen to what Saul says there. He uses the very language that the Lord uses in speaking with David about Caleb, about the Philistines. Saul now believes that David and his men have been given into his hand by the Lord. But what does Saul lack? He doesn't have the oracle stones. He doesn't have the Urim and the Thummim. But he presumes to know God's will anyway. He's confident that God will give David into his hand. He's read the situation. He sees that it's very advantageous for him to defeat David. And he thinks that everything is going his way. And that should be a lesson to us. But we need to be careful about how we read our present situation. In the absence of specific divine revelation from the Lord. We can be as wrong as Saul. We think that the Lord is telling us one thing, but perhaps he is saying something quite different. Just by way of uh, personal testimony here, there was a time in my freshman year in college when I firmly believed that the Lord had told me a particular woman. And that's not my present wife. <laughs> and I was sadly, but, but actually gratefully, mistaken on that. I did not marry this other person that I thought God had told me to do so. As it turns out that wasn't what God was saying to me. me. So Saul summoned all the people to war. Apparently he is going into Cala against a force of about 600 men with every soldier at his disposal. We don't know how many that was, but it would have had to have been a considerable force for the purpose of killing, in essence, one man. He's gathering an army together to go after David. Humanly speaking, the odds are not in David's favor. What's more, even though David had just liberated the inhabitants of Cala from certain death by the hand of the Philistines, David learns that they will turn against him and take Saul's side. And he tells Abiathar to bring the ephod to him in verse 9, and then in verses 10 and 11, he inquired once more of Yahweh. Will the men of Cala surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? And the Lord answered, telling David that Saul would come after him. David asked God a second time if the people of Caleb would give David and his men to Saul. And the Lord said that they would surrender him and his men to Saul. And so David and his men had just saved the city of Caleb. And the thanks they would receive from the people of the town would come in the form of betrayal. They were going to turn them over to Saul and his men. And so verse 13 says that David and his men departed from Cala, and when Saul heard that they had left the town, they gave up the expedition. And verse 14 says that David and his men remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of Ziph, which was about 15 miles south, southwest of Bethlehem. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give David into Saul's hand. God gave the Philistines into David's hand, but God did not give David into Saul's. Well, we see here that the king of Israel had abandoned all pretenses at this point. He was openly pursuing David and his men with his army. Saul had such overwhelming forces that the people of Caleb would be willing to surrender to him the man that had just saved them. The people of Caleb understood the odds. 
They knew there was no way that David and his 600 men could protect them in the way that, that he and his men had protected them from the Philistines. David didn't stand a chance based on these odds, but God did not give him into Saul's hand. Now, the passage that we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse, verses 1 to 11, it depicts a parallel event in the life of Jesus. It's not identical. We don't want to draw a one-to-one -one comparison with what takes place with David and, and these wilderness wanderings with what took place with the Lord in Matthew 4. And most often, and for good reason, we see the Lord's time in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, uh, going without food for 40 days and 40 nights, as having its reference point to Israel's 40 years of wilderness wandering. And that's appropriate. And we understand that Jesus succeeded where Israel failed, thus showing that he is true Israel. He was tempted by Satan while having no food or water for 40 days, and he did not give in to temptation. He did not sin. But Jesus' time in the wilderness also has a reference point to David's time in the wilderness when he was constantly fleeing Saul. David has had his trial in the wilderness, and so did his son by a, a great many generations, David. Uh, I'm sorry, Jesus. And God did not give either of them into the hand of their enemy. Now, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, you will not be given into the hand of your enemy either. That doesn't mean that you'll never suffer in this life. It doesn't mean that you won't experience setbacks or sorrow. You know that you will. Some of you are. Certainly most of you have. But what it does mean is that you cannot be snatched out of the hand of the one who has been given all things by his Father. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That is something that we need to take with us to our graves. You cannot be snatched out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also worth noting that in both cases, both with David and with Jesus, the word of God played a prominent part. David inquired of the Lord before he went to Cala, and then again when he heard that Saul was planning to come to Cala. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus quotes scripture three different times. But there is something else to take notice of in our passage in 1 Samuel. Notice that the first time David inquires of the Lord, and then in his follow-up question there, he does so directly. He does so without mediation. Abiathar has not arrived at this point. The battle hasn't been fought. Abiathar doesn't arrive, we learn later, until they've fought Caleb. That's where Abiathar comes, and he brings the oracle stones, the Urim and the Thummim, with him. David speaks to the Lord directly. He says, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And then again, uh, when he finds out that his men are afraid of attacking the Philistines, he asks the Lord again. But notice what happens when Abiathar does come to him after the battle at Cala. And he brings the ephod with the oracle stones. David, after this point, does not make direct, unmediated inquiry of the Lord. He uses the appointed means for obtaining the word of the Lord, the Urim and the Thummim. Jesus, when combating Satan in the wilderness, does not utter new divine revelation. But instead, what does he do? He quotes recorded scripture. Jesus was the embodiment, the physical manifestation of the revelation of God, and yet he quotes Old Testament revelation in this spiritual battle. So both David and Jesus deferred to God's appointed means for the revelation of his word, though each of them had unmediated access to Yahweh. David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord responded. But when the God-appointed means of revelation were with him, he deferred to the Urim and the Thummim. Jesus is God's revelation of himself to the world because Jesus is God in the flesh. And yet when pressed by Satan, he quoted the God-appointed means of revelation, Scripture. Now I know that there are many faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who believe that God speaks in an un, uh, a direct, unmediated way to them, even now. And this is not meant to be a slam dunk on our brothers and sisters. 
But I do think that this should make us all think a little bit further on this subject. The God-appointed means of revelation we have is even greater than the oracle stones of David's day. And God's word is not merely the means of revelation. It doesn't simply contain the word of God. Scripture is the word of God. Scripture is sufficient. It is God's complete revelation of himself to his people. And it tells us everything that we need to know about how sinners may be saved. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And God's word, scripture, is reliable. You can trust it. David and his men trusted God's word when he spoke to them and told them how he would give the Philistines into their hand. David trusted God when he spoke using the Urim and the Thummim. He would pursue them and that the people of Caleb would turn them over to Saul. And you can trust that just as God delivered David and his men from the hand of their enemies, you from the hand of your greatest enemy because God's word says God's word says so you can trust that you have been given into the hand of Jesus Christ out of which no one or no thing can snatch you by faith in Christ you are in the hands of Christ and brothers and sisters it doesn't take special direct divine revelation to know that All it takes is God's word telling you that. And you can believe it. And you can trust in it. For it is good news. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for how you delivered David. How you did not give him into the hand of his enemy Saul. And we thank you, Lord, for how you snatched us out of the hand of our enemy, Satan, and have placed us into the hands of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom no one can snatch us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to trust in your word. We pray, Lord, that no matter how we might think, how we might be convicted about your leading of us, your instruction to us, private words to us, O Lord, we pray that we would give precedence to your word, to the scriptures. We pray that we would hold it in highest esteem so that anything that contradicts it, we would understand that it is not from you. Please, O Lord, teach us to trust your word. And give us a deep love for it, we pray. Because it is the word of life. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would please turn.